So my name's Tracy Irons. I've been brought in today from Greyhounds New South Wales about talking to you guys about getting behaviour right. So what we want to do is to have all the participants on board about understanding greyhounds in the pet home and what we can do to make their transition as good as possible. So part of the strategic goals that we've got here at uh, Greyhound New South Wales is about giving these guys the best opportunity to find their way into a normal home. So we really want these guys to be set up as a companion animal pet and myself and Greyhound New South Wales are going to give you all the information we can to make that transition as easy and smoothly as possible. Part of the learning objectives that we've got here at uh, GRNSW is about understanding the concept of socialisation, how important it is actually to recognise the sociability in greyhounds, not only in the track, uh, but also off the track as well in a, a pet home. What we also want you to understand is understanding anxiety, fear and phobias that we can see in our dogs uh, once they go into a new home or any sort of um, behaviours that you might see uh, whilst in your care in the training facility. We look for any behaviour observations as well and look for any um, ways that we can actually improve the socialisation and habituation with these dogs uh, again whilst they're transitioning. So what I want to start off with is actually understanding the secret life of dogs and what we know about them and what we actually think that they are. So with the dog's cognition and psychology, it's really important that we understand how their brains work. We also know that dogs are emotional and impulsive. They live mostly in the moment and they have a less well developed uh, cerebral cortex than what we have which means they're quite impulsive with the way that they think the way they think uh, dogs aren't aware of right and wrong they're only aware of good and bad for them so again they're opportunist if something works for them they'll generally repeat those behaviors and if it's bad for them they'll generally avoid it but it's pretty much how they think they're very simple creatures they definitely can't think from a human's perspective at all so they're not worried about your emotions at all it's purely how they're thinking and their rationalization at that uh, current time so we need to go right back to basics about understanding what is a dog. So they have the cognitive ability of an 18 to 24 month old child. They are social animals, they like to be part of our group and they like to be part of our family dynamic as well. They have these cognitive abilities that don't create any alpha uh, roles in within their within their group. So this is a, a word that we've actually put on dogs which simply doesn't exist. They thrive best in structure, routine and predictability as well. If you think about the life of a greyhound whilst in work and whilst in training, their routine is very structured. They know when they're working, they know when they're racing, they know when they're getting fed and all of a sudden we take them out of that environment and put them into a pet home where things are uncertain for them. They're not sure when they're going to be fed, they're not sure when they're going to be walked. They don't know how their whole day is going to look because we've taken that away from them. So that obviously can increase their anxiety as well. Most dogs physical violence is avoided so normal dogs don't like to fight with other dogs. They have what we call a flexible hierarchy so it depends what's important to each particular dog at any particular time. Dogs also bark, they dig and they like their bones and toys and they do find things scary from time to time as well. So again when we are rehoming these um, dogs into a pet home we also have to remind people that at the end of the day they are still a dog. So what I want to talk about now is the foundation of dog behaviour and what actually determines behaviour. So we've got three contributing factors for that. We've got genetics, we've got past experience and learning, present environment and that's both internal and external as well. So with the genetics, we've got lots of components there. So we've got, you know, random genetics happening. We've got the lineage happening. So when you guys are breeding your dogs, I'm sure you're looking for the fastest, the strongest, uh, the ones most willing to run there. But in pet homes, what we're looking for is a dog with high resilience and actually can learn to cope as well. There's obviously going to be certain breed characteristics that we can't take away from these dogs at all, but that's also an influencing factor with the genetics. But all these dogs have individual personality types and we do have to remember that that when we've got a litter of puppies we're going to have different personalities within that litter we're going to have some confident ones some shy ones some timid ones some friendly ones and again that's what genetics brings into that uh, puppy's uh, temperament and personality 
So past experience is also going to influence that dog's behavior. So that includes socialization and something that we know now is it called habituation. And habituation is simply getting used to certain stimuli. So whether it's a train or whether it's a bus or whether it's kids but, um, yelling, um, other dogs, habituation is simply just getting used to. And it's really important that dogs are exposed to as much as they can, but they are coping in that situation as well. Dogs also learn from consequences of past events. So whether it was good for them or bad for them. So very similar if we go to the dentist and we have a bad experience at the dentist, more than likely we will not enjoy the next time we go to the dentist purely because of that one experience. So it's the same as dogs as well. So if we flood them or overwhelm them too much when exposing them, they may actually learn to fear it rather than enjoy it. So again, we need to be very, very careful when we're introducing new um, triggers or stimuli to dogs. But dogs are constantly learning throughout life. So again, just because we have a socialization period in dogs, we have to keep continuing their education in the outside world and make it as pleasant and as good an experience for them as we can. So we like to call these sand tracks in the brain. So when a sand track is actually developed in a dog's brain, it becomes a behavior that becomes learnt. And the more they use that sand track, the deeper in the pathway it is. So again, when we're trying to teach a new behavior in a dog, we may create a new sand track in that dog's brain, but that old one's going to be there. So this is what we call behavior modification as well. So what we need to do is be very, very mindful when dogs are learning from each experience, is it actually going to be beneficial for us or is it actually going to be uh, something that we need to maybe rectify or modify later on in life as well. So present environment also influences a dog's behavior. So that's internal and external. So when we're working with a dog, we have to ensure that they're healthy internally. So they're not only undergoing um, any underlying illnesses, any ear aches, tooth aches, any aches and pains in their joints, because that's also going to influence their temperament and external as well. So again, we have a lot of these dogs that actually go into new homes and they just get flooded by a new environment. So they're exposed to things that they may have never seen before. And again, we're just overloading these dogs to the point where they actually just shut down and they don't cope. So we also look at if we change that environment, we change that behavior. So we know when we go have these dogs in work that they're training, they're different in the home environment, in the kennels, than different than what they are at the track as well, because we've changed that external environment. So again, when we're adapting these dogs into a new home, if we can make their life as easy as possible to start exposing them to things that they may find in the home. So whether it's kitchen, whether it's a bathroom, or whether it's walking through a front door, stairs, all these sort of things, we need to slowly introduce these two dogs so they can actually learn that they're actually okay when we start presenting them into new um, homes. And again, every dog's an individual. So some dogs learn really quickly and some take longer than normal as well. So as you can see in this um, video here, how we have this external environment. So we've got the dogs barking at each other uh, amongst a uh, uh behind a fence and then when we remove that fence the behavior also changes with those dogs as well. So one thing we need to really understand about uh, dogs is actually understanding uh, body language. It's their only form of communication. We actually really need to listen to these dogs and what they're actually saying to us. They're a non-verbal species. They can't tell us how they're thinking. They can't tell us what they're feeling. So again, we have to look and read their body language to get that valuable information to us. And if you're rehoming dogs into a pet home yourself, educate these new owners about uh, body body language as well. What does a happy greyhound look like? What does a worried greyhound look like? What does a sad greyhound look like? What does an aggressive greyhound look like? That information is really valuable to a new owner so they can actually adjust what's going on so they don't allow that dog to escalate to any unwanted behaviours. So educate people. What does a greyhound look like when it's happy? What do you see? You see that waggy tail, you see the loose body wag, you see those ears to the um, side, you see their mouth open and they give us a smile, you know, where they have really soft eyes as well. And they might even do that little happy dance as well when they get excited to meet people. 
But when they start to feel uncomfortable, again, explain to people what this actually looks like. So those ears draw back, their mouth close, their pupils might dilate, their breathing may become really heavy, they might slow down, they may even stop. That tail might start to tuck underneath that body there. So again, give that valuable information to the owner so they're aware of the changes that's happening in that dog's temperament at that present time. So we have a couple of dogs here just to have a look at. We've got you know two golden Labradors, both the same colour, both the same uh, leather harness that they're wearing. Again, but we've got two different personalities or two different meanings going on in this one uh, picture. Now this is a snapshot of time, we don't know what happens before, we don't know what happens after, but by looking at this picture we can determine who we're going to approach and why. We'd probably approach the dog in the closer to us in this picture. He's got a soft body, his mouth is open, his eyes are soft, his ears are to the side and he's got that body weight sort of are coming towards us as well. It's not to say the guy further away for us is aggressive or um, is going to display any behaviors that may warrant us to be caution of us, but we may just need to take our time when approaching that dog. So his ears are forward, his body weight's forward, his mouth is closed. Again, he may just not be comfortable being approached by unfamiliar people and that's okay and that's something that we have to uh, draw on and just go right this dog on the left is probably the dog that we'll approach and we'll just worry about how we approach that other dog on the right there and maybe just use a bit of caution because we don't want those behaviors to actually accelerate. So when dogs are feeling anxious or worried, they actually have four options and we call them the four F. So we've got flight, fight, freeze and fiddle. And I'll explain a bit more about them uh, as we keep going along. So one thing, one thing we need to understand is that when dogs are actually feeling worried or scared, they have these four options. Now, we do modify dogs um, ways of actually not being able to do any of these behaviors. So such as flight, if we keep them on a lead or we've got them in a, a run, a kennel, locked up in a backyard. So they're able not to escape, not able to escape what is actually making them feel worried. So again, we need to think to ourselves, they have these three options left and we certainly don't want them to choose the fight option, which is the aggression option. So the option that the dog would choose would depend on these factors. So we've got the genetics there. Genetics, what is that dog going to do in certain situations? So when we have aggressive dogs breeding together, more than likely we may have aggressive puppies as well. So fight might be their default behavior. So again, when we're dealing with those dogs, we've got to be very cautious and manage them appropriately. Temperament is going to influence that behaviour. Past experience and learning is also going to influence that dog's choice as well. Has it learnt previously that when unfamiliar people approach that I just escape because it makes it easier for me and I like that option better. So again, we need to get all this valuable information and pass it on to new owners uh, that may be finding that their dog is not comfortable around uh, unfamiliar people that may come to the house. Present environment as well going to influence that dog's behavior. So again, those three factors, genetics, learning, environment is always going to be influencing those dog's behavior and, that do and the dog's choices when those four Fs are going to be present. So freeze is what we call the shutdown. So when these dogs are so overwhelmed by the environment that their only option is to actually shut down. It doesn't mean the dog is enjoying it. It simply means the dog isn't coping. I don't like snakes. If I had a snake uh, uh, over my shoulders, I'd actually shut down and freeze until that snake was actually removed. It doesn't mean I'm going to like it any better the next time I see a snake. It'll probably make me avoid it next time because the whole whole experience was just too much for me. So if you have a look in this video here, we can see this dog that's going out for a walk. It's not being defiant, it's not being stubborn. It may have not been exposed to traffic whilst um, in training or in uh, the, its previous life in the racing industry. And now we have an owner that's taking it for a walk out in the street. We've got trucks, we've got buses, we've got noise, and this dog simply cannot cope during that time. So you'll see this dog freeze it will shut down that tail will go underneath it will be too scared to move so again educate owners about what they're actually seeing there and don't class it as a stubborn 
defiant or naughty dog. This dog simply isn't coping and this is where we need to get this dog some extra help. So fiddle behaviours are something that dogs do when they're feeling a bit anxious or a bit worried. So again, they present in so many different ways. You might see dogs avoiding eye contact, licking their lips, uh, yawning, turning their heads, sniffing a body shake. Uh, they may even grin. They may even chatter their teeth. Um, some dogs even mount, um, hump as well. There might be a lot of hypervigilance and scanning the environment as well. So there's a whole list of uh, behaviours that dogs actually do when they're feeling a bit anxious or a bit worried. A bit like people, some people may chew their nails, twirl their head, they may even stutter. So again, we need to look at what's going on in that dog's environment and going, right, this dog isn't comfortable at this particular time. What do we need to do to manage it so these behaviours don't escalate? So other fiddle signs you might see is dogs are distracted, they're unfocused, they may stop eating treats or they may snatch treats, mouthing, muzzle punching is when they jump up with a closed mouth, they seem all out of sorts, they seem like they've got, you know, their ears are falling off and these dogs just simply aren't listening. It's just that environment is just too much for them at this particular time. So again, what we need to do is maybe slow down or take them to another environment where they actually can cope. So if you have a look at these videos here, we've got some dogs here that actually are fiddling and um, I've done some pop-ups for you so you'll be able to identify how these dogs are actually um, showing these fiddle behaviours. So when we communicate with dogs, it's really uh, important that they understand how we're communicating with them and again how uh, we're working with each other so we actually keep these dogs at a really good safe level, emotional level, that they're not going to escalate or do any behaviours that cause us to um, have any worry or concern. One thing we know for sure is dogs know that we're not dogs. So there's no point actually acting like a dog. There's no point bar, uh, the word bar, uh, barking, growling, snarling, flipping dogs over because this is what other dogs do. Dogs actually know that we are not dogs. So there's no point actually displaying behaviours that make us look like dogs. Dogs behave differently towards other dogs as well as they behave differently towards people as well. So again, don't worry about this miscommunication, be a person, work with your dog, understand actually how they communicate and work with them a lot better that way there. They've evolved over thousands of years to actually be expert body readers of ours. So they know our body language. They know everything about our day. We have our own private stalkers that live with us. They know when we're going for a walk. They know when we're going to the shops. They know when it's dinner time. They know where the treats are. So again, they have watched us uh, so many times throughout the day that they can actually work us out better than we know ourselves as well. So again, it can be very confusing if we start reproducing dog signals to dogs because they simply don't understand it uh, from their point of view. So if a dog's overwhelmed, some basic etiquette for dogs that uh, might be a bit overwhelmed with a new person coming into their environment, and that's simply just turning side on, avert your gaze and maybe crouch down to that dog and allow that dog to have the choice to come to you or not come to you. So again, work with that dog and work out whether it wants to approach or not approach. If it doesn't want to approach you, accept it and go, that's actually okay. It's like people, we don't go and hug everyone in the supermarket. We do like to have distance and we like to have a safe space between us and other people and unfamiliar people. And it's the same as dogs as well. So again, understand it and work with, with what you've got. Dogs do respond to a play bow though, which is a lovely thing to see. So that's an invitation of, of play. Well, like we see in the greyhounds, they do lots of zoomies in the backyard and that play bow is always present. So again, if you do see that, it is something that we can both do to each other. I want to briefly talk about the brain with the dog here. So again, it's really important that we understand how their brain works. So we have two main centers of this brain um, that I want to talk about today. So we have the emotional center of the brain, which we call their safety brain and the rational part of their brain. So we have this little red center called the amygdala, which is your flight fight response. When that is on the other part of the brain, so the logic thinking part of the brain isn't working as well. 
So that amygdala would determine what choice that dog's going to do. Are you going to stay and fight or are you going to flight? Are you going to get out of there? So when that little safety brain is on, it's about protecting the dog. And what we need to do is keep that brain uh, closed and allow that logic thinking part of the brain to be working so it can make good choices and not be so worried or frightened. We know in ourselves when that amygdala is actually working, it gives us that adrenaline through our body. We feel um, that shock, that wave of shock uh, go through our body if something startles or scares us. So again, that's your amygdala telling you flight or fight, what are you going to do? And it happens in our dogs as well. So when we've got a dog that is really anxious or really worried, that little amygdala is telling that dog to stay safe. So he will make choices that best suits it. So again, that that amygdala brain can happen one twentieth of a second so it will shoot through the body to prepare it to either flight or fight. So again when we have these dogs that seem aggressive or shut down or fearful, that emotional safety brain is actually telling that dog to do those behaviors. When that thinking part of the brain is on, so that cerebral cortex there, it, these dogs are actually able to learn, they're able to respond, and they're actually able to retain that information that they're learning at that particular time. That is the best time to actually train or work with dogs as well. So when they're calm, they're relaxed, and they're actually able to see information, take it in and learn from that as well. When that safety brain is on, so that amygdala is on, that actually inhibits them to learn anything at that particular time because they are fearful and you cannot learn when you're afraid or worried. So again, you know that feeling yourself, it also happens in our dogs as well. So we call these responses flipping the lid. So we've got these four responses here, the flight, fight, freeze and fiddle. And when that's closed, it's safe. And when we flip that lid, it exposes those four options there. So again, what we need to do is keep those dogs lids closed so they actually can learn and retain that information. So in summary of dogs' behaviour, again, remember they have the cognitive ability of an 18 to 24 month old child. Keep it really simple for these dogs. You know, again, they're learning and trying to cope in a world that they haven't been exposed to before. So make it very simple and make it very easy for them. They rely heavily on our body language as well as we need to rely on their communication on back to us as well. So again, look and see how your dog's emotional state is by reading their body language there. It's really, really important that we get all the right information so we can adjust what we're doing. <music>